in keeping with the food theme today, um, also with the, or beverage theme, I should say, um, the next topic uh, will become clear in a minute. Um, this is kind of the, the lead into that. So. Ladies and gentlemen, please calm down. Please listen to me. I want to tell you what's going on with the ship. Thank you. We've been thrown off course just a tad. What's a tad? What's a tad? What exactly is a tad? In space terms, that's about half a million miles. The bombs you feel are asteroids smashing into the hull of this ship. Also, we're flying without a navigational system and can't oh, seem to change right. course. Miss, are you telling us absolutely everything? Not exactly. We're also out of coffee. Your crew is in complete control of the situation. So, yes, our next topic is about coffee, which is obviously the lifeblood of the hospital. And um, for a long time, there's been, I think, well, I'm not going to go, I'll let Dr. Bishop say what the, the myth is. Um, but so our, our next speaker is Dr. Andrew Bishop, our senior resident, will be talking about the next <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. So, yeah, next myth is talking about uh, coffee and caffeine and uh, whether or not it poses an increased risk for uh, cardiac arrhythmias. No disclosures. So, um, I'll go over just the myth briefly and then I'll kind of spend the most of the time just looking through the data and about a bunch of different trials. And observational studies, and then I'll spend a moment at the end just talking about uh, risk factors for cardiac arrhythmias. So uh, the majority of this presentation is based off this study that was published in JAMA last year, talking about coffee consumption and tachyarrhythmias, and they also did this Mendelian randomization to try to help uh, add an additional randomized controlled element to it at least. Um, so, but first, we'll talk about where the myth came from. And honestly, in my reading, it's not completely clear, but it seems like it's mostly just been passed down as anecdotes over the years that have just kind of gathered momentum. And then maybe with the addition of a couple studies here and there, especially this one that was published in 1980. Um, so in this one, they start out by talking about you know, anecdotes have long suggested that caffeine containing beverages and other personal habits and excesses trigger palpitations and cardiac extrasystoles. So they took the opportunity to uh, do a systematic population study. They looked at 7,300 men only aged 37 to 57 who had no previous history of heart disease or diabetes. And then they followed them to see how much uh, ectopy essentially that they would, uh, th that they could measure. And so what they did was they did consecutive screenings of these 7,300 men with uh, two minute halter monitor EKG studies uh, as they came in. And then they had them answer questionnaires about how much coffee uh, they drank essentially. And these were all men in the Minneapolis um, Twin Cities area. And so here's an example of the data that they presented. Uh, and I think the first takeaway is like pretty impressive how much caffeine or coffee these people are drinking. Um, you can see, I don't know if you can, where's the pointer? So they show the, on the x-axis here how many cups of coffee they're drinking and then percentage of men who have any ventricular premature beats. And as the amount of coffee goes up, once you hit like nine, 10, 11 cups per day, it starts becoming significant. 
Um, uh, here's an example of another study that kind of also uh, perpetuates the idea that caffeine can be responsible for some um, arrhythmias. This one, they're looking at hospitalizations for AFib, uh, also in a male population. So they, uh, this was done in 2001, and they took a random population, they say, of men, 7,500 men aged 47 to 55, and they followed them for 25 years. 750 of them were hospitalized with a diagnosis of AFib. And then they, anal they retrospectively analyzed the data to try to determine what were the risk factors that would lead to hospitalization for AFib. And in their findings, they found uh, the following factors significantly were associated with future hospitalization for AFib. I'll just read them off. Family history of MI, stroke in the mother, dyspnea on, exertion, or on entry, alcohol abuse, high body stature and body weight, high blood pressure, but not diabetes, high serum cholesterol, uh, high heart rate, smoking, coffee consumption, physiological stresses. So that was in 2001. Um, and there's not too many of these studies that can show data to support uh, caffeine being a risk factor for arrhythmias, but there are a few. Uh, and it hasn't uh, just been in you know the ancient past, uh, not that 2000 was that long ago, but this study is, is like a, you know, professional society guideline published in circulation, pretty reputable journal as recent as 2017. And there were these are some management guidelines for ventricular arrhythmias. And even in their little synopsis here on page one of their study, they say for mild symptoms, avoidance of aggravating factors such as excessive consumption of caffeine or some pathomimetics may be sufficient. So, you know, the notion that caffeine is involved has persisted and it's still seen uh, even in recent literature. And it's not just uh, providers that have this idea. Uh, I think patients also can identify with it. Uh, and I think a lot of it is it just kind of passes the common sense test that caffeine could cause actually like, yeah, yeah, it makes sense, you know, kind of jacks me up. So this, this, was, a, this was just like a observational study uh, where they uh, took 1300 patients that enrolled in this heart e-health um, study and they, these were all people that had symptomatic AFib and they had them complete questionnaires and just report what they perceived as their self triggers. Um, and so you can see 35% said alcohol, 28% said caffeine, exercise, lack of sleep. Those were the most reported findings. So maybe now I'll circle back down to the original study that I brought up that was published in JAMA. Um, so th these guys, uh, these were study, uh, was performed at UCSF. Uh, here in California, and they were looking at this cohort of participants in the UK National Health Service, and they did, it was, it was a prospective cohort study. So they had patients that were aged 40 to 69, recruited between the years of 2006, 2010. And when they first came on to the, the study, they completed questionnaires and underwent physical exams and then collected some DNA samples. And the primary outcome they're looking for was incident tachyarrhythmias followed over that time or up to 2018, actually. And so uh, they excluded pregnant women. They excluded people who are unable to finish the study and people who are lost to follow up. And so they uh, ended up with 386,000 participants, uh, mean age of 58. 52% female, and they were followed for four and a half years. Over that time, there was about 17,000 that developed instant arrhythmia. And on their analysis of the data, they actually found that for each cup of coffee consumed, and these are just for questionnaires. So they filled out all the questionnaires when they first enrolled, and then they looked, at, looked back at the data years later to see, uh, but they only answered the question one time. And they found that for every additional cup of coffee, you actually had a 3% lower risk of instant arrhythmia uh, or developing an incident arrhythmia over that time. And this was after adjusting for a whole range of uh, risk factors, including age, sex, race, ethnicity, hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, coronary disease, congestive heart failure, valvular heart disease, cerebrovascular disease, peripheral artery disease, CKD, cancer, education level, smoking, alcohol, tea consumption, physical activity. So and then here's a um, table of their data, just this Kaplan-Meier curve showing on the y-axis, you have your patient's percentage of cumulative instance of any arrhythmia. 
uh, by coffee consumption and then on your x-axis is time and they're showing that so people who had no coffee are this top line uh, they were the most likely to develop you know new instant arrhythmia and then the more coffee you drank your risk actually decreased so and their findings they said were significant that was pretty interesting uh, here's that da same data just presented another way in this forest graph. And here they're looking at, they have all the, all the different arrhythmias that they were assessing for. And then on the left side of the graph here, these are the, they favor factors that lower the risk of instant arrhythmia. And so all arrhythmias in this big lump are significant on that side of uh, the graph. And then AFib, SVT, are also significant. And then for ventricular tachycardia, you can see unadjusted, it crosses the significance line, but adjusted and adjusted it does as well. Premature atrial complexes, same. And then through the ventricular complexes, it's non-significant, but it sits on the right side of the axis there, which would favor uh, caffeine actually does increase the risk of it or suggests at least, but non-significant. And then the other thing they did in the study, uh, which was unique compared to a lot of these other coffee and caffeine studies where they did this uh, Mendelian randomization, uh, which the idea there is that you can use kind of nature as a randomized controlled trial and it's supposed to be at least relatively bias free. Uh, and the idea is that most coffee research over the years has been based on self-reporting. They've all been observational and not randomized. And so they're prone to social, behavioral, and physiological confounding factors. And you can use Mendelian randomization to help mitigate some of these limitations. So basically what you do is you identify alleles uh, in a common genetic variant that are associated with the factor that you're studying. So in this case, coffee, caffeine consumption. And then you have to make sure that those uh, variants are not inherently associated with the outcome you're looking at, as in the, in this case, it was this CYP450 enzyme um, and make sure that's not inherently affecting arrhythmias by itself. And then as long as you meet those two criteria, you can use the idea of nature's random property of meiosis uh, to, in assigning genotypes to infer causality. So they genotyped everyone that came in looking at 800,000 different single nucleotide variants. Um, and specifically for this study, this CYP uh, enzyme that's thought to be responsible for metabolizing caffeine, which has been shown in previous studies. And then they also uh, constructed this pylogenic score by combining seven different uh, variants of this enzyme. Uh, and then, so the higher your genetics, your uh, polygenic score, would indicate the slower you are of a caffeine metabolizer. And then they found objectively the people that had the higher scores uh, drank less coffee when they looked back at the data. And then significantly, they looked at all the data and they did adjustments and without adjustments, and they found there was no significant risk of arrhythmia, regardless of what your uh, polygenic score was. And so here's that data in, a, in table form. And basically this is specifically for the polygenic scores and they have all the different arrhythmias, like I mentioned before. And then the p-value is non-significant for any of them suggesting there's no association between the two. And then this is that data looking at just having the CYP variant and not using the polygenic score. And still there is no association with more or less arrhythmia regardless of what your uh, variant was. And so they're uh, using that to help argue the case that regardless of how much coffee you're either consuming or not consuming or how well you're metabolizing it, it's not really affecting uh, arrhythmias or new instant arrhythmia at least. Um, so they have a couple of mechanisms that they introduce as uh, maybe explaining this phenomena. And so they say for AFib at least, it's, it's known to be more likely to occur in the setting of a short, shorter atrial effective refra refractory period. And then caffeine appears to prolong the left atrial refractory period. Um, it's also known that caffeine can, it does block adenosine receptors and that high doses of adenosine are known to trigger AFib. Uh, so reducing AFib attributed to inhibiting the adenosine receptors has also been shown in observed uh, animal models. So maybe it's just blocking the adenosine. 
And then they also point out that coffee is an antioxidant. So maybe having these anti-inflammatory properties can uh, reduce instant arrhythmia to some degree. Um, I think, oh, so this the little title is just microscopic there, but this is as imported from Keynote and uh, come over qu quite correctly, it looks like. But these, so these are the limitations that they recognize in their study. First, that the coffee intake was self-reported, uh, which they realize. But they do say that the data obtained before the development was obtained before the development of the outcome of interest. So that should at least negate the recall bias. And then they point out that the Mendelian randomization is not completely protected from bias on itself. Uh, for instance, the CYP enzyme that metabolizes coffee is also strongly affected by smoking status, sex, ethnicity. So it is possible that adjusting for some of these other factors could have introduced um, a collider bias. Um, they think that's unlikely, but a possibility. And then the idea that caffeine metabolism uh, and its variants are proxies for caffeine intake is also somewhat convoluted in that it's hard to assess, you know, just because you metabolize it faster, you're drinking more coffee, Coffee does that really mean you have less caffeine in your system? And what's the actual biological caffeine levels versus how much is the speed is being metabolized? So it's just hard to assess for that. Uh, so what about PVCs and PACs? Um, the one arrhythmia I showed in that study that did have a possible association with caffeine were the ventricular and uh, basically the ectopy. And so this is a study uh, that looked at consuming caffeinated products specifically for cardiac ectopy. So they studied, uh, these were participants in the cardiovascular health study. They wore 24 hour ambulatory halter monitors uh, and they were patients without persistent AFib. And they asked them to fill out questionnaires about how much coffee they drank and how much tea and cat or uh, chocolate as well. And their main outcome they're looking for was PACs and PVCs per hour. So they had 1400 participants, 46% male, mean age 72. And they found that there was no difference in the, the number of atrial complexes or ventricular complexes per hour across all levels of coffee, tea, and chocolate consumption. So they also found there was no association. And they also did adjust for confounders. Um, so then talking specifically about atrial fibrillation, because there's that's the one that's been studied uh, more than any of the other arrhythmias. So this is a an article that was published in uh, uh, American Heart Association uh, in 2019. And they're looking at uh, consumption of coffee and reported trigger of atrial fibrillation. And so this one was prospective study looking at participants in this study or in the their, uh, study group where they had almost a thousand participants and they asked them how much coffee, caffeine they consumed or how much coffee they consumed. And then they looked at the instance of AFib uh, based on annual quest questionnaires over nine years. And they also found that their data suggests uh, a lower risk of AFib among men who reported coffee consumption in this like low to moderate range of one to three cups per day. Uh, so this is looking at AFib in women because a lot of those other studies were in men. And it's similar to the other studies where they took a big group. This one had 33,000 women who were healthy and they did a questionnaire, asked them how much coffee they were drinking. Then they followed them for time. I think there was this one where they followed them for like 25 years or 14 and a half years. And then they looked at how much AFib they had over that time. And they said, our data suggests the elevated uh, caffeine consumption does not attribute to increased burden of AFib in this population either. Uh, another similar uh, study looking at coffee consumption doing questionnaires. This one's meta-analysis from a couple different studies. And they had, it was Swedish participants, 41,000 men, 34,000 women, followed for 12 years. And they also went back and looked at how much AFib that they had over this time and found there was no evidence to support coffee consumption was associated with more AFib. Now, uh, uh, 
I've lost one of my studies in this, I realize. Darn. You know, another one I was looking at last night was sort of interesting. This article published in Circulation, they were looking at ectopy specifically, uh, like PACs and PVCs, or maybe it was maybe it was this one. And as I was looking through it more carefully, they had they talked about these other studies that were done historically looking at ectopy, uh, specifically people who had a diagnosis of ventricular tachycardia. Um, one of them was published in JAMA in 2000. And I think they, so they took 22 participants and who had VTAC and they monitored them. They, they put them on telemetry for an hour. Then they gave them a loading dose of caffeine of 275 milligrams. And then they watched them for another hour and they found that there was no significant difference in the amount of ectopy that had like ventricular ectopy specifically. And then there's another similar study done around that time is 2000 or 1989 published in, I think the internal medicine archives. And they had 50 participants who had a diagnosis of VTAC and they gave half of them decaf coffee and half of them decaf coffee with an additional 200 milligrams of caffeine added. And then they washed them for three hours on telemetry and found there's no difference in the amount of ectopy they had over that time. So those are like, you know, um, at least prospective trials with a challenge. Um, so it's kind of interesting. So um, may I'll take a second to talk about risk factors for arrhythmia, things that are known to at least be associated with increasing risk of AFib. And at least from the original Framingham Heart Study cohort, the main risk factors they found were age, hypertension, uh, heart failure, coronary disease, valvular disease, diabetes, and then other novel risk factors that have kind of uh, been looked at since that original, those original studies were this notion of increased pulse pressure as a measure of aortic stiffness, um, uh, obesity, or OSA, uh, independent, independent of obesity, physical inactivity, or poor cardiorespiratory fitness. And then there's also, they found there's an association with excessive or high intensity endurance training. And then there's uh, heritable uh, genetic components as well. And at this point, they say that AFib cases without an identifiable risk factor are now less than 2% based on all these known risk factors. And this is just a graph showing that, showing that data. Now, here's the different risk factors that can um, put you at increased risk of developing AFib. CHF obviously is the big one. I think ischemic disease specifically, male gender, coronary disease, hypertension, uh, left ventricular hypertrophy, and then these other ones are diabetes here, and then these ones become unsignificant, but at least associated alcohol, cigarette, BMI. And then on this side of the graph here, these are, so cumulative probability of AFib if you combine these risk factors. So the bottom line here is if you have none of these risk factors, and then as you add them, your risk of, of developing AFib increases. All right. Okay, any uh, questions or comments for Dr. Bishop? Seems like we can all feel good about having our morning coffee now. We don't have to worry about keeling over from a V-fib arrest or something. Uh, unless you drink more than nine or 10 cups a day, it seems like that was the only study that actually showed a, actually any kind of relationship, maybe. Um, so, I mean, it sounds like the evidence is pretty, pretty overwhelming. I don't know, you know, this is again, one of those myths that like the origin, who knows where that came from, but it, I think people have been talking about this for as long as I can remember about the, you know, don't drink caffeine if you've got arrhythmias or PVCs or palpitations. Um, that's why we do this conference, right? To bust these myths. So any, any other comments? Nobody? Okay. All right. So how many people feel that this is true? Caffeine increases the risk of cardiac arrhythmia. Plausible. Andrew. Andrew. 
Um, let me bust this bad boy. I think this is uh, kind of busted. Yeah, I just hit it. Oh, I think you're good. Your dot there is screwing it up. I think it's both. <laughs> 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 